Hello and welcome to Portfolio Matters. In today's share talk, we will be discussing the Kazakhstan vanadium developer and producer, Ferro Alloy Resources, whose share price has shot up this week. But before we get into it, Richard will read the disclaimer. Thank you, Keith. Everything discussed during the Portfolio Matters podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be considered as investment advice. Listeners should be aware that we will be discussing securities that we own or have a financial interest in. Please do your own research or consult a professional investment advisor before making any decisions regarding topics mentioned on the show. A full disclaimer can be found at the end. Tell us lots about Ferro Alloy Resources, Keith, please. Thank you, Richard. Okay, this is going to be a long one. So this is very much a live issue. Richard and I um, lucked into this story last week when we were covering another vanadium miner. And um, I bought some last week and it would, you know, entirely fortuitously, the share price shot up on Monday. So I spent a lot of the week digging around, finding, trying to find out what's going on. Now, to warn viewers, on Portfolio Matters, we discuss the positives and the negatives of every share we cover. Existing subscribers will be well aware of this, but if you have come onto this program expecting just a puff positive piece about the company, you are in the wrong place. You're very welcome to keep on watching, but we always discuss positive and negatives. And if you don't like hearing negative things about the company, then please don't abuse us. If we've got something wrong, then feel very free to let us know. And if you can convince us we are wrong, we will change our minds. So moving into it, Ferro Alloy Resources is, has a big development project in Kazakhstan. Okay. So Ferro Alloy Resources, their share price has been incredibly volatile in the last few days. As of this morning, the share price is at 30p and that values the company at 97 million. The net cash and the enterprise value I'm going to skip because it is doing all these fundraisings at the moment. It will have cash, but frankly, something seems to change every day. And as a result of the Vision Blue Resources investment this week, it will have cash but it will depend on how many of its uh, entitlements Vision Blue have um, executed in the last few days and going forwards, but certainly they now have cash. Uh, forecast revenue for 2020 year end is 3.1 million. So this is small currently, and the investment case very much depends on development. Okay, so in summary, we are going to be saying this is an absolutely extraordinary opportunity that the shares, even at 30p, having trebled in the last few days, are very, very good value. But up until the involvement of Sir Mick Davies, this was a failing enterprise that was going nowhere, that the current management had completely failed in its funding regime and attempts, the IPO had been completely mishandled. And without the investment of Vision Blue, the enormously positive economics of this um, development were unlikely to have been realized. And FAR could have continued hobbling along for years searching for investment. But if Sir Mick Davies, who is now going to be chairman, can turn this around, this is an amazing opportunity. So this is share price. The IPO was at 70p and it never hit 70p. The share price collapsed. Now, if you listen to the um, CEO interviews, he is blaming that on insiders selling shares. And certainly when I went to buy some last week, I had no difficulty buying a moderate amount of a very small company. So there were shares available. 
And as you can see, in the last few days, the shares have absolutely shot up. They've shot up from 10 or 11p to 30p. So they've trebled in a week. OK, so what happened? Why did the share price collapse? Well, the bottom line is, I think they completely messed up the IPO because they got greedy. They valued the company at 220 million and they only raised 5 million. Now, 5 million did not get them anywhere at all. They could have halved the IPO price, been less greedy and raised a lot more money and then they wouldn't have had as many problems. So you see in 2019, they were talking about funding for stage one and they're talking about project financing and royalty streams. And we have separately covered lots of mining royalty companies. And that is a perfectly viable way of funding a development such as Balassos Candic. And they had been talking to banks, sovereign wealth funds, export credit departments, and others. And the Development Bank of Kazakhstan was analyzing the project. And they were talking about not trying not to dilute shareholders, which is exactly what they've now done. So in May 2020, they announced that the vanadium price has collapsed and then they have it start having to dilute shareholders at six and a half P. So bear in mind, the IPO was at 70 P and within 18 months, they're raising money at six and a half P. I mean, frankly, this is if I would put money in at the IPO, I would be absolutely incandescent. They then start raising and money through bonds and these are all very small amounts getting to frankly laughable amounts so the 2019 results that produce 152 tons you know these are very small numbers then in september 2020 you're talking about they've developed the technology to directly produce vanadium electrolyte for vrfbs and they raise ten thousand dollars through a bond sale I mean, $10,000 um, in September, they raised another half a million via share sale at 8p and 300 grand of a bond. They sell their first calcium molybdenate in October 2020. And then they've been doing small bond sales. I mean, bear in mind, they need 100 million, 100 million to do up phase one. Then on the 11th of November, they raise a further 152 uh, thousand on the Kazakhstan stock exchange and again in January and essentially you know this is taking them nowhere they need a hundred million it's just keeping things ticking over then suddenly on the 15th of March there is the vision blue investment and that sends the share price flying okay so we have covered the vanadium market um, separately in a special video just on vanadium and I hope you watch that and also in our share talk on Bushveld Minerals. So just to quickly cover it, vanadium is quite a small market. The vanadium is, has twice the abundance in the earth crust as copper, but we produce 20 million tons of copper a year and we produce about 110,000 tons of vanadium. Vanadium has twice the price of copper. So, if we wanted to produce more vanadium, we could. But vanadium has quite specialist uses, mainly in steel, strengthening steel. And you can see here, this is the price chart, and it has a history of price spikes, mainly caused by anticipated changes in Chinese rebar standards, where the Chinese would mandate higher vanadium content of steel. Now, you'll see that in the recent weeks, the vanadium price has been drifting up. But in the context of much, much higher prices in 2018-19. OK, so what are ferro alloy resources doing differently? Why is this such a great opportunity? And the answer is they are going to apply acid leaching to the vanadium market. Now, currently, the vast majority of vanadium is produced as a byproduct of iron smelting from magnetite, and that involves heating the rock up to at least 1100 degrees C. 
acid leaching does not require those high temperatures. OK, so we're just quickly going to go through acid leaching. Now, this is a very well established technique that is used extensively in the gold, copper and uranium industries right now. It's very well suited for low grade resources and heat and acid leaching are slow processes where essentially you heap up the ore, you pour acid onto it, you wait for the acid to percolate through the rock, dissolving the metals in them. Then you collect the pregnant um, liquid at the bottom and then you refine the metals from that liquid. Now, the problem with applying this to vanadium is vanadium is not very reactive. And when you try and do it, you essentially don't get enough of a recovery of the metal. So in recent decades, they have been experimenting with autoclave acid leaching. And this involves essentially putting the acid and the ore in an enormous pressure cooker, heating it up to nine atmospheres and 270 degrees C. And this is what ferro alloy resources are going to be doing. Now, put things in perspective, about 22% of world copper production is from acid leaching. This is not a new technique. And this is heat leaching, which is used extensively in the copper industry and by, for example, Central Asian metals, where I have a shareholding. But it's not suitable for vanadium. Vanadium is just not reactive enough. And this is what they use in the uranium industry. And this is in situ acid leaching. And they pump acid down into the earth to dissolve the uranium in the rock strata. And then they pump it back out again in what seems to me an environmental disaster, but they do it. And this is a very old technique. So acid leaching was actually first described in the 16th century in 1540 and in the 16th century it was also being used in the Hart mountain in Germany to produce copper in the 19th century they started producing aluminium and gold and early 20th century um, gold leaching using cyanide became um, used throughout the world so this is a very well established technique however as we've seen, normal gravity leaching techniques are just not suitable for vanadium because vanadium is not reactive enough. And so this is the diagram for autoclave acid leaching, and this comes from Scandium. So this comes from Scandium International, which, who also use it. And this is a continuous process. So they have found a way of pumping ore and acid into the autoclave, which is at nine atmospheres and 270 degrees C. So this is really quite an advanced um, manufacturing process, industrial process. Okay, so if we follow this through, you get the ore from the mine, you um, scrub it, you mill it, you mill it very fine. So you want the maximum surface area. So you want the, the the ore to be crushed to like mi millimeter and sub millimeter grains. You then add water to thicken it into a slurry, add acid, and then you preheat it to about 90 degrees C, and then you pump it into the autoclave with sulfuric acid. And in the autoclave, it's at, as I said, nine atmospheres and 270 degrees C, and then you churn it around for an hour, and then, you pump it out, and this is a continuous process, which I find absolutely amazing. Now, bear in mind, it comes out of the autoclave at nine atmospheres and 270 degrees C, and you need to get it back to normal atmospheric pressure. So you have a series of flash tanks where you progressively cool it down. Then you separate out the liquids, and you begin the process of extracting the minerals you require, the metals you require. Okay, so these are the existing autoclave and absorption 
circuits from the Soviet era that they are currently expanding and refurbishing at the uh, site in Kazakhstan. And if you read the IPO document, there are good descriptions of Soviet era experiments in acid leaching and trying to get the vanadium out. OK, so why has acid leaching not been used before in the vanadium industry? And the answer is this is actually quite recent technology. Um, the Soviets were obviously experimenting with the technique in the, the early 2000s, but don't seem to have published anything in English. The first academic papers I can find are acid, academic uh, on acid leaching of shale deposits come from China in 2010. And then the technique was patented in December 2012 in China. In 2013, American Vanadium Corp proposed using acid leaching on the Ghibellini deposit in Nevada, and that is still not in operation. So they've been developing that for years. So these things take a long time. Mine development is a long process, permitting, getting the finance, etc. cetera. Um, and let's quickly look at the Ghibellini prospect in Nevada, and this is from a recent presentation. And as you can see, they are now beginning the to get the permitting, they hope, and then engineering will follow, followed by construction, followed by production in Q4 2023. Now, bear in mind, they started talking about this in 2013. Long time, capex of 117 million. Now, look at OPEX or CAPEX. The OPEX, so this is how much is going to produce the um, vanadium. Cash cost of $4.77 a pound vanadium pentoxide. All in sustaining cost of $6.30. Break even, including all corporate costs, of 7.75. Now, the current market price is only 8.1. I find it absolutely not astonishing they're going ahead with this. That's where we are. So they're expecting a massive spike in the vanadium price. Now, as we discussed before, people are expecting demand from vanadium redox flow batteries to add to the demand for vanadium and increase the price of vanadium. As we discussed in the previous episodes, we are very skeptical about that. The, from the data we have found, vanadium redox flow batteries currently cost about twice as much for lithium ion batteries for utility size developments. And as the vanadium price rises, then so that differential will get larger and larger. And we just cannot see how you can have a spike in the vanadium price and demand for vanadium redox flow batteries. That is a contradiction in terms. And so the Ghibellini mine would seem a desperate gamble. OK, so let's move on to ferro alloy resources. Okay, it's got two operations. It's got the existing operation with its capacity for 700 tons per year, and they are expanding it to 1,500 tons. But the upside is in this, the ballast source Candic project, which they are saying development phase two has an NPV 10 of 2 billion. Okay, bear in mind, that even after the shares have trebled in the last five market days, the market cap of this company is only 100 million sterling. Okay, so this is a photo of the pit from the prospectus with black shale. Okay, so why is the Balacandic, ballast source candic development so good, so cheap. Well, you don't need to roast the uh, ore. There's no need to pre-concentrate it, whatever that means. 
but recovery rates very high and but above all it's got these very valuable byproducts which actually as you will see mean the all in sustaining cost after accounting for value of the byproducts is actually negative and this is the ore body and the ore body is enormous so so far they've only looked at all body one but there are another four this this um diagram only has four out of the five now they are saying that the resource estimate for all five is 100 million tons which is equivalent to 670 million 670,000 tons of vanadium pentoxide which is five years of current world production. So this is an enormous resource. And this is the data to back that up. Size of the ore body is 110 million tons and contained in it is 750,000 tons of vanadium pentoxide. And they are saying that the cost of production after accounting for the byproducts is negative. It's minus 1.2 pounds per pound, per one point, minus 1.2 dollars per pound of vanadium pentoxide. Now bear in mind that the current market price is $8.10 a pound, and they're assuming in their modeling seven and a half. Now in, by way of comparison, the vanadium company that we analyzed last week is guiding to 17 and a half to 19 dollars per kilogram of vanadium. Now, if we just use the vanadium price and assume there is no cost of conversion into vanadium pentoxide, that equates to um, 9.6 to 10 dollars 70 per kilogram of vanadium pentoxide or for basically four and a half dollars. So you see, compared to a traditional producer, the economics are completely transformative. And they're saying that the, um, you know, phase two, they're going to be kicking off $430 million a year. Okay, bear in mind, current market cap, $130 million, $140 million, sorry. Okay, and this is the table from the IPO documents talking about the development. And the business model assumes a vanadium price of $7.50. Now, you can see here that they're assuming you need $10 million to refurbish and expand existing operations, $100 million for phase one, $225 million for phase two. Now, $100 million they need to raise. They would hope to fund phase two from the profits of phase one. Now, throughout, they talk about how low the royalty is, but they never say what it is. But it must be low because if it's included in the cost, the costs only equate to 23% of revenue. So the royalties can't be that high. And they are in Kazakhstan, where the income tax is 10%, profit tax 20%. And they have agreed a tax exemption until 2026. But we don't know what the royalty rate is. Now, Kazakhstan is eight times bigger than Germany. It is enormous. And it has very good existing infrastructure transporting to China. Central Asia metals, for example, and Kaz minerals all export a lot of copper into China. So there's a lot of infrastructure there already. Now, what are the byproducts? Well, the byproducts are vanadium. Sorry, the main product is vanadium. The byproducts are black carbon, which is used in the manufacture of rubber. Uranium, which everyone is quite excited about because there may be a developing um, supply deficit. Potassium alum, which is used in fertilizer, rare earth elements, and also molybdenum. And they have sold their first um, molybdenum. Okay, so, but the big thing about this company is the fundraising. 
it seems the project, the economics look great. But if the economics look great, then why have they just sold 20% of this company for essentially 9 million quid? You know, what's going on? If it's that valuable that you don't sell 20% of this company for 9 million, if it's going to be producing 430 million a year when phase two is in operation. Well, the bottom line is, to my mind, they have completely messed this up. The current management have completely messed up the financing. So they did an IPO beginning as less than two years ago, April 2019. They did an IPO at 70p. And but they only raised five million. And to me, that just seems like total greed. They overstated the price of this this project. They tried to raise, minimize their dilution. They only raised five million. And then to put things in perspective, the Vision Blue fundraising was done at 9p, so an 87% discount to the IPO price. And the Vision Blue have essentially, if they exercise all their rights, they will have 21% of the company for eight and a half million. Valuing the company when this deal was done at 9p at 36 million. So IP done, PO was done at a valuation of 220 million. Vision Blue bought 21% of it at 36 million. What happened? What was going on with the IPO? Well, I think they got greedy. This is the vanadium chart from the IPO documents. You can see it's very elevated. The IPO, the current vanadium price is 8.1. They're assuming seven and a half now. So you see after this, the vanadium price collapsed. So I think what they were trying to do was raise, they were very confident in this project they raised a tiny amount trying to minimize their dilution. This is the use of funds from the IPO documents. And you can see they were raising just enough to expand the existing operations. But what happened, I think, was the vanadium price collapsed and with it their cash flow and they couldn't even finish the initial expansion. So anyway, their plans, phase one and phase two, for the first expansion of existing operations, 10 million, then 100 million for phase one, 220 million for phase two. And in phase one, you're talking about 5,600 tons of vanadium pentoxide, 3,000 tons of vanadium, and in phase two, you have 22,000 tons. Bear in mind the world market, we are putting roughly, and this is a generous estimate, 120,000 tons. So at 22,000 tons, you're gonna flood the market. But that's 10,000 tons of vanadium, but still you're gonna have a big impact. And they're saying that ballast source candic can produce 50,000 tons of vanadium per annum. At that point, you flood the market and they are aware of this and hence they don't have plans to produce 50,000. Mm. Now, this is from the October 2019 uh, presentation. They're talking about trying to raise other forms of funding, streaming finance, royalty sales, export back finance in order to fund the development without shareholder dilution. And as we have seen this week, it didn't work. They have just done massive share, well, not massive, but big shareholder dilution at a valuation of 36 million. I think there's a lesson there, isn't there, Keith? The total obsession with not having shareholder dilution actually is, is a very negative um, yeah. thing to do. And Ultimately, by underfunding the company, they've had to take, as you say, a massive dilution. Yeah. And um, it, um, it sort of, it, it makes, it, they've made themselves complete hostage to fortune by not raising sufficient funds to, exactly. in the first instance, to see phase one through. 
Precisely. Absolutely. So total funding package from Vision Blue. I mean, frankly, this is not a big funding package. Right. Um, nine million sterling at nine P. You know, and actually the initial investments are tiny. I mean, actually, it only put in one point five million dollars at nine P. And then there's a convertible loan note at one point six million. Uh, sorry, one point six million convertible no loan notes at nine P as well. So, you know, this is a tiny, tiny investment. And then there was the potential for further investment of 9.5 million and 9p. Well, obviously, he's going to do that because the share price is now 30p. And if he took up all those entitlements, he would invest 9 million. And that would give him 21% of the company. And then he has further entitlements, $10 million at 25p. Bear in mind, the share price is now 30p. And then a further 20 million at 78p. Yeah. And Sir Mick Davies gets to be appointed chairman. And that is an unalloyed good thing, frankly. Um, and then he has a right to a negotiation offtake agreement. So who is he? Who is Sir Mick Davies? Well, he is an indus mining industry bigwig. He doesn't have a wiki page because he's too big, but he does have a link. Uh, doesn't have a LinkedIn profile. So he has a wiki page. He was the CEO of Extrata made loads of money out of extrata and then i think he was the um treasurer of the conservative party anyway he's gone but he's since gone back and has raised 300 million in the us via a spac and ferro alloy resources is his first deal and frankly it's a bit of a corker i think i mean he's already trebled his money now who's the ceo has uh overseen this fiasco well he has been with Ferro Alloy Resources for 12 years. And before that, he was the CEO of Hambledon Mining. Now, most of Hambledon Mining has been scrubbed from the internet. And I've had to go into the way back machine to try and find out stuff. But the bottom line is, it's not a happy story. It was taken over at 2p in 2012, a valuation of 20 million. After, and this is quite an achievement, they managed to be fined for environmental infringements in Kazakhstan. So there you go. That's your CEO. He has some talent. We'll give him that much. Um, so what does Sir Mick Davies and uh, Vision Blue bring to um, Ferro Allo Resources? Well, number one, they bring credibility. The bottom line is this was a totally failing enterprise with a great resource that they were finding it very difficult to get funding for. Now, you know, share price has fallen from 70p at IPO to a low of 6.5p, one of the fundings, and they've recovered to around 10p. But, you know, clearly, the bottom line is the market just wasn't believing them. They were able to raise only very small amounts. So number one, Sir Mick Davies has brought them credibility. Now, if you're an existing far shareholder and you think, oh, you know, he's bought into the company and taken 25% for a song. Well, frankly, he has absolutely saved this enterprise. Um, and so for a very small amount of cash, he has uh, bought 20% of the company. And the good news is he's coming in as the chairman and he brings all his contacts, etc., and you'd hope that he would then be able to arrange mine financing and see this thing through to development. Okay, so let's run through some numbers. Now, bear in mind, all these numbers are taken from the numbers provided by the company. So we're taking a few things on trust, frankly. Um, we will use their number of seven and a half P, seven and a half dollars a pound. Bear in mind, the market price is currently 8.1. And uh, the initial phase, they're guiding towards 1,500 tonnes. Bear in mind, currently it's much less than that. So that's 3.3 million pounds. And they have a, currently have a tax exemption if you work all this through. I'm afraid I did this two days ago when the share price was 25p. It's now 30p. So you have to guide these down slightly, but you get an idea. The I 
before the tax exemption expires, you would have a forward cash flow multiple of 14. So not expensive, uh, post-tax, uh, after the tax expiry runs out, cash flow multiple of 17. So this, essentially these shares, if they don't do the expansion, these shares are expensive. Now, phase one, they're guiding to 5,600 tonnes. That's 12.3 million pounds. Cash costs are negative, as we've covered, due to byproducts of carbon black, uranium, potassium alum, molybdenum, and rare earth elements. So you're selling for seven and a half dollars a pound, and the cost of your vanadium is minus 1.2. That equates to annual cash operating profits of $135 million. Okay, now at 25p, that's 0.8. At 30p, it'd be one. Forward cash multiple of one. And we don't know what the tax or royalty numbers are, but clearly cheap. And at 10p or 9p where Sir Mick brought in an absolute song. Phase two, they're aiming to produce 22,000 tonnes, which is 49 million pounds. And that equates to 430 million cash operating profits per annum. At this point, the numbers just start getting a bit silly. It's very, very cheap. So let's start running through some alternative scenarios because if you start producing this much vanadium, the danger is you're gonna drive the price down. So let's assume a price of $6, you then get to 356 million, again, you know, dirt cheap, $5, dirt cheap, $5 and no cash byproducts, dirt cheap. Now, can the vanadium market absorb an extra 20% supply? The Chinese rebar standard is actually quite, currently quite low by international standards. So they could certainly use more vanadium in their steel. And if the vanadium price were to fall, they probably would do. And also the vanadium price would be very good for the adoption of vanadium redux flow batteries. As we've talked about before, interest industry commentators are describing the cost of vanadium redox flow batteries as being about twice the price of equivalent lithium iron. So vanadium price fall would have some positive imp impact on the, the price of VRFBs. But if you were completely to get rid of the price of vanadium itself, VRFBs would still be 1.2 times the price of lithium iron. So it will have some impact, but will it be enough? Now, one of the reasons that vanadium redox flow batteries are more expensive than lithium iron is that lithium iron batteries have got economies of scale. So people have invested in the manufacturing capacity. And as you produce lots of tiny lithium iron batteries, you have lots of production improvements. Now, clearly, you could also have production improvements in the manufacturing of vanadium redox flow batteries if you were to get production at scale. So if they were to get increasing adoption would drive price improvements. So it is possible that VRFBs could start to get much more traction in the West than they currently have. They are getting some traction in the, the East. But the bottom line is, short term, it absolutely would have an impact. But bear in mind, phase one and phase two are currently on the drawing board. This is all potentially years in the future. These are the numbers, and the numbers are not really very relevant because these are the numbers for the existing operations, and you see they are not very big. You know, they've been expanding. Um, but this year and until they get phase one going, you know, there's not really much going on. You're really hoping and believing that some Mick 
is going to enable the financing of phase ones and two. Okay, so let's get on to the positives and negatives. Well, the application of acid leaching has the potential to revolutionize the production of vanadium. And FAR have a big resource and they're one of the first people we can find who are gonna use this. So FAR will become the lowest vanadium producer in the world. If they can get this going, then the shares are absolutely extraordinarily cheap and this is a big multi-bagger. Um, so Mick Davies has bought in, he brings, he's now the chairman, he brings cash and credibility. You're also relying on his contacts to find mine financing. And frankly, you know, the mine royalty mining royalty companies, you know, I can't see why they wouldn't want to fund this. You know, it looks very good. And with his credibility, I think he has a very good chance of finding funding. He also, as chairman, will be in charge of ensuring that the executive team is the right one and can push this forward. And that means, how can I put this politely? He would have the ability to change the management team. There's also a very good tax regime in Kazakhstan. The negatives. Well, the current management team, frankly, do not have the, the um, confidence of the market. You only have to look at the share price to see that. The share price in 18 months collapsed from 70p at IPO to lows of well below 10p. And they completely messed up the IPO, in my opinion. So we have big questions about the current management team. So really, you're expecting some Mick Davies to drive the turnaround, drive this forward. And that is why he's made such an enormous difference to the share price. Suddenly, he's instilled some confidence into this project. And the bottom line is they still need 325 million. They still need 100 million. He's only put in 9 million sterling. He will, that will be enough to complete the refurbishment and redevelopment of existing operations. It won't get even close to developing the 100 million they need for phase one. So in summary, this is a story we, Richard and I, lucked into last week when we were analyzing another vanadium company. And um, I bought a small amount. And then very fortuitously, the um, Vision Blue um, investment was announced and the shares have trebled. However, we think the shares are still extraordinary value if this project can be got off the ground. And we also think that in order to get this project off the ground, you really are relying on Sir Mick Davies to turn around what was currently actually a failing enterprise. The share price had fallen from 70p to sub 10, and they were making absolutely no progress with the financing. And they've essentially had to give away 21% of the company at a knockdown price to get funding. So, uh, Richard, what are your thoughts? Uh, so, I think it's a fascinating company, Keith. It's uh, well spotted and, and very well presented. I think, um, you know, as, as um, opportunistic investors, one relies upon management getting things wrong in order that a, a business's potential value mm. is, is, um, is created. And um, clearly something's gone very seriously wrong here. I guess there are two two ways it can go, aren't there? They raise funding and develop it all out themselves. Also, Mick Davis and his team um, develop it to the point at which a, a large mining conglomerate would wish to buy it yes. uh, and, and realises the value much more quickly, but at a point in time where it is a clearly a credible, viable business with um, decent levels of production and so forth. And I'm guessing that that might take a, a couple of years to achieve. Um, I think it's th these things, it's always difficult to say, well, should you buy it? It's gone up threefold. It's gone up threefold, as you say, since we spotted it late last week. Um, should you buy it at that point? Well, I suspect that the answer is it's it's beginning to move up, back to a point which which reflects the intrinsic value at the moment with the uncertainties. 
Yeah. And as those uncertainties become resolved, it will obviously become more valuable, all other things being equal. So uh, I don't I don't think on this particular one, I don't think the ship has sailed if you want to, to yes. invest. But um, clearly you have to do your own due diligence and, and um, be careful with uh, the size of, size of your investment. But it's um, and the other point I would make, Keith, is that it is so cheap that what it will do if it goes into full production is it would simply knock out the high cost producers and the vanadium price would settle down to whatever the marginal, the highest marginal producer produces it at, roughly speaking. Um, so in some senses, I think I suspect the threat to the vanadium price is relatively, mm -hmm. relatively low. Um, even even as they up their production to several thousand tons a year. Yes, that's true. And and also, you know, this is all in the future. You know, currently it's producing very little. So yeah. there is a threat to high cost vanadium producers, but it's not yet. Yeah. It's talking, you know, five years down the line, possibly. Yeah. So that's really good, Keith. Thank you. Thank you very much for taking the time and effort to prepare a very interesting presentation. And um, um, yeah, thank you very much. OK, well, thank you, everyone, for watching. I would reiterate that on Portfolio Matters, we um, discuss the positives and negatives, and we generally just say what we see about a company. And I'm afraid if you dislike the negatives, you are very welcome to tell us what we got wrong in a factual basis. And if you can convince us, we will change our minds. But please don't, don't just shout abuse at us. It is tedious. Um, so on that note, Thank you to all our very many Portfolio Matters subscribers who we have had many positive um, interactions with. But last week we had a few negatives on the uh, other Vanadium producer and we will skip on. So anyway, thank you for watching. Um, I hope you'll press subscribe and like. And it is goodbye from Richard Wheater. And it's goodbye from Keith Jordan. Goodbye. goodbye. Full disclaimer, the material and information contained in this podcast is for information and entertainment purposes only and should not be relied upon for making a business, legal or any other decision. We may own or have a financial interest in any securities mentioned. Listeners should conduct their own research or consult a professional investment advisor before making any decisions regarding topics mentioned on the show. Whilst we endeavour to ensure that the information presented on the show is correct, we make no representations or warranties of any kind, expressed or implied, with respect to the podcast and website or to any information, products, services or related graphics discussed or presented in the podcast or website. Any reliance you place on such material is strictly at your own risk. You are solely responsible for the investment decisions you make. We will not be responsible for any errors or omissions in the podcast or website, including in articles or postings, for hyperlinks embedded in messages or for any results obtained from use of such information. Nor will we be liable for any loss or damage, including consequential damages, if any, caused by a reader's reliance on any information provided by the podcast or website. Please do not listen to the podcast if you do not accept self-responsibility for your actions.